Hey, I'm Faligan, and in this video I am showing you my character creation process from start to finish, this time on Batgirl. I'm working from a concept from Sergei Barul, the pronunciation of which I know is incorrect, so check out the link in the description to his work, as well as if you're looking for more of a step-by-step -step tutorial, since this is more of an overview process, I'll throw a link to my Gumroad down below as well. Let's not waste any time and dive right in on those fun beginning stages of character blockout with our good friend, the Sphere. I've been asked a lot recently about why I don't use base meshes when I sculpt characters. Essentially, why do I always start from scratch? Well, there are multiple reasons for that, but the main one is that most of the characters that I sculpt are so vastly different. There's not one single base that I can start from that would be all that helpful. With realism, there's a lot more room for similarities and overlap. But when it comes to the stuff that I do, one character might be a square and another might be a circle. The variation in shape language alone makes it not really worth doing. Another reason is that often when you start from one point, it's difficult to get rid of the preconceived form that you already have to get to where you need to go. It's like trying to paint the landscape of a beach, but for some reason you decided to start with an older painting of a forest. It doesn't really make too much sense, right? Also, I kind of just like the practice. I enjoy sculpting and I think it's fun to see something really cool get created from absolutely nothing. That's why I really enjoy making these kinds of videos. It's really hard for me to describe what I do for a living, especially to people who have no idea what 3D modeling even is. These videos help show off the process for people interested or for people looking to pick up some new tips and techniques along the way. Or at least that's my hope. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to talk a ton about my blockout process here because I just released a new video where I go in depth on exactly that. So I feel like I've talked about my process a lot, but one thing that I love about stylized sculpting is that each character is so unique, and this Batgirl is no different. She is deceptively simple, and simple is often confused for easy, right? There's not a ton going on in terms of accessories or lots of parts, but I'm gonna have to do a lot of work to get this silhouette to really shine. And that is something that I'd like to talk about more with this character than I have with others. Silhouette is so incredibly important when it comes to sculpture in 3D form. It's something that I touched on briefly in my last video, but I really didn't explain why it's so important. Silhouette, for those that don't know, is essentially the main shape of your form if you were to fill it all in with one solid color. Essentially, it's the outline of your shape. If you've ever seen one of those crime dramas where someone had a body on the floor previously and they put tape around it, that is your silhouette of your person, essentially. Now this is incredibly important in 2D art for obvious reasons, but why is it so important in sculpture and 3D art? So silhouette or outline, I'm just going to call it line for right now. Well, line indicates form and shape, direction and even volume. And learning to recognize and use line to better understand the shape of something is kind of easy to talk about, but difficult to actually do in practice. For example, when I am, say, looking at the shape of this character's leg, I am revolving that shape around in my head and thinking about what it needs to look like from all other angles. Then I start creating this in 3D, continuing to make sure that my volumes are wrapping properly to maintain that specific shape. And then I reference back to the main view of my image to see if things are still lining up with the concept. I'm using anatomical knowledge, knowledge of my fundamentals like shape language, how to make a shape more appealing, and just drawing from pure experience. But the main thing that I'm paying attention to here is line, the silhouette of the shape I'm trying to recreate. So maybe it's not so easy to talk about now that I say it out loud. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. It's definitely one of those things you have to do a lot to get a feel for. But understanding your fundamentals is the most important thing that will help you here when trying to revolve a shape in 3D. I've talked about fundamentals many times in my videos, and if you'd like to learn more about that and what makes one shape more appealing than another, you can check out my course, The Appeal Academy. I'm sure you've seen a character design that you liked more than others. We don't need to look too far back to see things like the Sonic movie redesign for examples, uh, but you've probably been in one of these situations where you were browsing Instagram or whatever and saw one design that stood out above the rest. And maybe you could attribute that to personal taste, but there are objective things that make something more appealing or attractive than something else. That is exactly what my course is about while taking you through the character creation process and offering mentorship the whole way through. But that's all I'll say on that. Link down in the doobly-doo. Check it out if you're interested. All right, now that the simple blockout is complete, it is time to move into refinement. This part of the process can feel overwhelming at first, but really you just have to keep sculpting and moving around your 3D model as much as possible. Personally, I like to work on the face early on to help the character come alive, and it's the most interesting part of the character for me as well, but before I move up to the face, I refine the body quite a bit during this stage. 
I spent a good amount of time working on the shoes and legs, trying to get a little more form down there to inch closer to the concept. I even set up a live boolean to subtract part of the shoe. And I'll talk more about booleans here in a little bit. I go back and fix a lot of this later on, but it's nice to have something in place for now. After that, it's up to the arms for some quick changes and then to the torso. When I sculpt, I like to exaggerate the form that I'm trying to create. I do that in the chest a little bit here to start getting the hit in the silhouette for the breast, as well as the curve of the back on the opposite side. I really wanted to get a sharper line under the chest and then another transitional line for the break of the rib cage. I softened both of these later, but just having them in for now is really nice. When I sculpt, I enjoy pushing things to the breaking point and then slowly nudging them back into place until they start to work again. This is a great way to learn how to exaggerate and see how far you can push your form. I do the exact same thing with this character's butt, getting some sharp transitional planes in place. I don't spend too much time down there, however, because I know the pose will change a lot of that shape. Then it's up to the face to begin blocking out the major planes of the head. Now with this one, we have a three quarter image reference, which if you're working from a single image is one of the best angles that you can have. It gives you a lot of information about the shape of the head. In this case, the corner of the mouth pulls out to form a plane break on the cheek. You can maybe see a little bit of that pull out there. So that is definitely something I wanna make sure is present in my sculpt. I'm also really paying attention to the shape of the eye socket. There's this really nice line wrapping around that area. And if you'd like to learn more about how to recognize and sculpt these shapes, I'll add a link to another free tutorial on screen right now. And this is so stupid, but I think it's important to have fun while you sculpt, whatever that looks like. I love sculpting stupid little faces on whatever I'm working on. Sometimes I'll even leave them on finished models hidden somewhere where you can't see them. Sculpting can take many, many hours, so it's important that you have some fun with it. Now, even if it looks a little scary, I recommend getting some paint on your model early on. This is helpful for seeing proportions. Just make sure that you toggle it off every now and again to make sure things like your surface are still looking good. Color can hide a lot of problem areas if you aren't careful. Next, it's on to the eyes. These eyes are pretty large. There's not too much to really say about them other than that. I've talked a lot about eyes in my previous videos. I create a separate mesh for the eyelids here and merge that into the head after I'm done. I think it's a lot easier to control your form that way. Then I use the temporary paint for the face mask to extrude actual geometry. I hate the little extract function in ZBrush because you can't see how thick something will be until you calculate the extraction, and that always takes forever. So I typically use the Z Modeler brush or some form of polygroup extrusion for this kind of thing. Next up is adding a little more paint to the face. The face in the concept is super pale and I wasn't a huge fan of that at first, so I play around with warming it up a lot more. I end up adjusting this to be closer to the concept later down the road, but I still keep it a bit more warm than what it is in the original image. After this, it is time to add some very simple geo to block out the cape and hair. A lot of the shapes in the original Batgirl image look very flat, uh, like the hair and cape. So I do quite a bit of work to try to make those look good from every other angle while still being true to the original image. This is not something that is very easy, but your fundamentals help a ton here. And then of course the belt as well as the little pieces that we need around there, all very simple for now, but will be refined later down the road. Next up, we are back down to the boots to do some more refinement. I spend a decent amount of time down here just working on the main shape and trying to make something that feels like both of our feet. Luckily, we get to see the foot from two different sides in our reference, which is typically helpful but occasionally destructive. This is often caused when things are drawn drastically different from two extreme angles. We have a little bit of that going on here, but really it's not that bad, and with a little attention to both sides, we start pushing closer to where we need to be. I spend some more time defining the ankles and then it's back up to the arms and hands. I start forming my hands into a basic fist shape, more or less getting the fingers where they need to be while working on the main shape of the overall palm and forearm. This continues to evolve and change over the course of the character and by the time I'm done, I'm still not super happy with how they turned out. Hands, like sculpting many things, are really tough, but I didn't want to throw four more hours at these so I left them where they were Looking back at the final sculpt, which you will see soon enough, I think they came out as passable. After some more work on the hands, it's time for everyone's favorite part, posing. Posing is always so much fun because it's the time when we get to really just break everything that we've done up to this point. A lot of people get hesitant during the stage and really it's just best to keep pushing forward and understand that with posing, some things are bound to break. 
For instance, I am bending one of the legs over 90 degrees. That is going to cause a lot of geometric squashing and stretching in that area. And I spend a lot of time to clean that up after I'm finished in Transpose Master, which is the name of the plugin being used to pose right now. Transpose Master is technically a plugin, but it's come with ZBrush by default for as long as I can remember. In the grand scheme of things, I'm actually posing this character pretty early on. This is a little under four hours in and there is still a long way to go. So I spend some more time here working on the angles of the arms as well as the cape and hair, trying to make those look more 3D by adding some twist here and there, as well as taper and straights and curves. The main thing though is paying attention to the line of action of your character's pose. This is the main line of the body, which gives us the curve of the arched back, making her feel like she is moving forward quickly. I love watching Transpose Master do its thing after you're done. Right now it's taking all those changes I just made to the temporary mesh and applying them to all of my individual subtools. It's always just kind of fun to watch. You know, you just gotta appreciate the little things sometimes. <laughs> I won't show too much of the poly modeling for the gear on the belt because I know how boring it is to watch, but I will show a little and talk about what's going on. For all of this, I am using the Z Modeler brush, which is less of a brush and more of a context sensitive tool. This allows me to interface with the three main parts that make up an individual polygon. So vertices, which are the points, edges, you know, the lines that connect those points, and faces that connect everything up together. There's all sorts of functionality here like extrusions, bevels, tons of nifty little things that you can do. It is missing some of the functionality that you need that you would of course have in a fully fledged poly modeling program, but it gets the job done just fine here. I really enjoy playing with these tools and if it's something you're interested in learning, I of course have another free tutorial on that as well. I actually use the Z modeler brush again to extrude the thickness for the cape. I spend a little more time tweaking angles and making that feel closer to the concept. Very boring stuff, but you know, things that need to get done. Then I get to have some fun with the hair. This is really interesting, probably the most interesting part of this character in my opinion, because of how flat it looks in the concept. I wasn't sure how I was going to do this when I first saw the image, and it was a lot of fun to just play around with and make 3D. <laughs> All I have to work with is the basic shape of the silhouette and the few lines running down it that show direction. So I start with what I have, getting that basic silhouette and sketching in the lines running down the hair. Then I start adding some volumes to these segments to break up the form even more. Definitely a lot of fun just experimenting with the shape and making something that looked good. From here, I do a quick refinement pass on the body after posing. There are many things that need to be tweaked and I find that jumping around your model can be helpful to take care of those things quickly. I make changes to the face, arms, in particular that one pointed elbow which I return to later, the knee which I said I would need a lot of work on, and the butt which also needs a lot of work. <laughs> Turns out a lot of things need a lot of work, but hey, that is sculpting for you. The pose wasn't feeling dynamic enough to me and there were some small changes I wanted to make. So I hopped back into Transpose Master to make all of those changes at once. I think I do this once more later on to make proportional changes to the legs and head, but really it's something that you can do at any point and it's a great tool to have in your toolkit for a large number of tweaks. And that's honestly how most of my brushes are as well. I don't have a brush that is for working on eyes or a brush that is for working on hair. I have a few brushes that I use for creating everything. And that's actually how all professionals that I know work as well. Essentially, you can do a lot with a little. If you are interested in my brushes, you can download them from my Gumroad down below. But honestly, I like to encourage people to make their own. But hey, they're there if you want them. Now for the very fun process of cleaning up my hands. This takes quite a while and I won't bore you with every little detail, but I dynamesh and combine everything in the hands and continue to refine the shape. I like to use Z Remesher and projection to get back my form while maintaining subdivs. This makes it much easier to control your geometry than just plain dynamesh. After I'm done here, I move on to more cleanup all over the body, again making a pass where I jump around and fix anything that really stands out. If you're having trouble seeing those problem areas, I recommend taking a screenshot of your model, flipping your image, and then come back a little bit later, pointing out any errors that you see. Essentially, this helps to refresh your eyes and give you a bit of a new perspective. Next, I wanted to add a little more shape to the eyelashes, so I spend a little time doing that. Nothing too crazy, just a couple little pieces that break up the shape ever so slightly. The thing that is important to recognize here is that you never work on only one area, 
call it finished, and then move on to the next part. You should be constantly jumping around and making changes as you notice new things. This is a common problem that I see with beginners where they get stuck in one spot and can't seem to progress. If this happens to you, just move on to somewhere else for a little while and come back later. Trust me, it's not going anywhere, it'll still be terrible when you return, but at least you'll have a little bit of a break from working on it. Alright, this is my second favorite part that I get to talk about, which is the cape. It was so much fun to figure out. Essentially, the way that I've done this, I have the main shape of the cape going where I need it, and now I need to create the bottom jagged edge. So I use what are called booleans to make this shape. I've talked about booleans before, and I think they have a lot of uses, but here I'm using them to subtract a shape from the cape. So I take some time to create a few pieces of geometry that slot into the cape, and then when subtracted, create the jagged bottom edge that we need. Booleans can be pretty complicated, but here it's very simple. Think of them almost like a cookie cutter, and I'm cutting out and removing the shapes that I don't want. There are so many cool things that you can do with booleans. I use them all the time, and I've used them all over on this character. But this was kind of my favorite use for them, and I wanted to highlight it. From here, I am pretty much done with the bulk of the work. It's a lot of polishing before going into rendering, but I don't want to downplay this stage as there is still a lot going on. I think this part of the process is where we can grow the most as artists, because we have the opportunity to essentially push past our limits. When you get to that point where you feel like there is nothing else you can do, take a break, step back for a while, and come back with fresh eyes. I think you'll be surprised by how much you can see that needs correcting. One of those areas on this model for me was the hands. I returned to those a couple times, pushing them a little farther with each attempt. I still don't think they turned out amazing, but with all things, finished is better than perfect. And hey, there's always the next little project, right? Now off to rendering, which I don't normally record because my computer wants to kill itself when I start turning on lights, but I thought it would be cool to include a little bit of this process. I use a very simple studio lighting setup with a key light, fill, and a backlight. I actually include a couple more light sources here to help fill in some of the shadows, which is more or less dependent on what you're trying to light. For instance, I wanted to get a softer fill light coming from the front of the character to help fill in the bottom of the shoe and legs. There is a lot that goes into lighting, and it takes some time playing with your values to make sure things are not getting too blown out while setting the mood for your piece. I also played around with the background color to try some warmer tones, but I wasn't really liking the contrast. So I just let my rim lights color the background with a slight bluish tone. And from there, it's as simple as pressing render. <laughs> well, I still do some small touch-ups in Photoshop, but that stuff is pretty simple. Level corrections, tweaking shadow curves, etc. Oh, and I totally forgot to put her bat symbol on her chest, so I just kind of painted that on in Photoshop. Don't, don't tell anybody. Here is the final render of the character. I hope you guys enjoyed the process and maybe learned something new along the way. Something I mentioned earlier was my Appeal Academy course, and I wanted to share one of my recent students' progress. Here is where Rico was when he started the course, and this is where he is now. He's not even finished with the character yet, and I'm so excited to see him polish this even more. If you want to learn more about creating appealing characters at your own pace with personal feedback on your progress, check out appeal.academy. If you're not ready for that yet, but still want to learn more about digital sculpting, I offer mentorships and other courses that you can find at gumroad.com slash folygon. That's where my brushes, materials, and all that other good stuff is as well. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.